we're grateful that you have given us this day. We're so very blessed that you have given us this opportunity to gather here this morning and to study and learn from your word. As we enter into this, this hour of study, help us to meditate and focus our hearts and our minds to remove the thoughts or maybe the distractions that exist within this world and focus solely upon your word. Dear Lord, as we enter into this day of worship, help us to remember that this day is meant as a day of exaltation of your name, that this day is meant as a way of uplifting you and encouraging others to become followers of you. We know that every day should be dedicated in service to you, but especially this day, this Sunday, is a way of exalting your name, a day dedicated to worshiping you. Help us to do so with clear hearts and with clear minds, ready to be molded by your word, strengthened by your word, and encouraged by your word. Dear Lord, we're blessed in so very many ways, and included within that is our good health that we often take for granted, but we're reminded of those who maybe are struggling with sicknesses and illnesses at this time. We want to say a special prayer, especially at this time for Ms. Huff, as she continues to recover both with her struggle with her surgery and her broken leg, as well as uh, with her battle with COVID at this time. Give her strength and comfort. Help us to do what we can to be there to assist her in any way that we know how. Help us to reach out to her and show, us, show her our love for her that has first been shown to us. Dear Lord, we're so very blessed in so many different ways. Often we take these things for granted. Help us to stop, to slow down, and to focus upon these blessings from time to time and be reminded of your wonderful work within our lives. Dear Lord, we're grateful for all that you do for us, and it's through your Son's most holy name that we do pray. Amen. All right. The book of Psalms. This is Psalms for Beginners. And if you'll notice, that's not my name under the, under the title. Uh, this material is from a man by the name of Mike Malazongo. Uh, Mike is a very intelligent man from Oklahoma, a member of the church, and uh, has done a lot of really good in-depth studies. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a uh, website called BibleTalk.tv that this information comes from. And I was told of this, uh, of this website when I was studying for uh, a, the series on church leadership, on elders and deacons. And I haven't looked through everything, so I do want to preface by saying that I cannot fully support everything. But from what I have seen... And from the classes that I have taken, the studies that I have done, everything seems to be in line with the Word of God. Um, and included within that would be his class on Psalms. Now, this is, I'll warn you, this is the first time I have used somebody else's material in this way for a class. Um, oftentimes, you know, even when uh, we, we use Brother Winkler stuff in uh, the ladies' class sometimes, and any of the ladies who took the ladies' class and had Brother Winkler's book knew that we touched it about five times in the whole quarter. Okay, we're going to look into Mr. Mike's or Brother Mike's work uh, very in depth. And a lot of the information that is given is given directly from him. And because he did such a good job on, on examining uh, the Psalms. Now, there's some uh, important things concerning the Psalms that we need to kind of take into consideration. Uh, we mentioned that we would not be doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book, and that is because uh, that would take way too long, uh, and we would lose maybe focus of what we should be focusing on in that period. And as a result, I think that it would maybe make it to be less uh, uh, in, as fresh on our minds or less important, or we might try and get through too many too quickly. And I think the result of that would uh, make it a little bit more difficult for us instead of actually making it easy for us to understand. And so when we look at this Psalms for Beginners, the thing that I want us to notice about this uh, specific study is this is intended to teach you how to learn the Psalms. This is not intended to teach you the Psalms. This is intended to teach you how to learn the Psalms. What I mean by that is this is meant that we take the information here and that we apply it into our reading of the book of Psalms. There's a few things that we want to... Uh, encounter, if you will, or a few things that we want to uh, take care of within this book uh, or within this study. And those uh, are our approaches to study, the first of which being the reviewing of history and the authorship. That's a little bit of what we're going to touch on this morning. What we're going to touch on, uh, not next week because Brother Irby will be here, but the next, we're going to examine technical information concerning Hebrew poetry. Now, uh, I don't know of anybody in here, myself included, who understands the Hebrew language fully, who uh, can read or understand maybe even Hebrew poetry fully, 
what we're going to try and do is not necessarily learn the language, but we're going to learn maybe some of, the, some of the ins and outs of their poetry. And the reason why that's important is because the book of Psalms is a book of Hebrew poetry. So if we understand maybe how and why certain things happen or are written certain ways, uh, then it might help us to understand a little bit more of our study of, the, of these uh, texts. If you'll notice, in Psalm chapter 1, I told you to go ahead and read Psalm 1, Psalm 23, and Psalm, uh, I told you 67, but I meant 77, and we address that Wednesday night a little bit. If you'll notice in Psalm 1, Psalm 1 doesn't rhyme. You know, when we think about poetry, what do we often think of? Rhyming, or even maybe flowing, or having some sort of, of pattern that it follows after. And even in the first psalm, all the way through the 150th psalm, you don't really find rhyming. Uh, that's because it's not written in English. <laughs> it's written in Hebrew. And even in Hebrew poetry, Hebrew poetry doesn't often rhyme. Hebrew poetry has a completely different way of examining uh, poetry. Our poetry is, is totally different. So if you were reading the book of Psalms looking for good poems, well, you might find one or two, but you're not going to find a lot because it wasn't written for the English uh, version of poetry. And so you, you can look at beautiful, uh, uh, po almost poetic, we might call them, passages in the book of Psalms, like maybe the 23rd Psalm, which is one that we also encourage the reading of, probably the most common of the Psalms to be read. And, and you can find beauty within that in a very poetic sense. However, it is not really English poetry because it wasn't intended to be written uh, as English poetry. It was Hebrew poetry translated into English. And so if you're looking for rhymes or, you know, catchy, witty ways of, of looping around, you might not find that because it's not as it is intended. Uh, the other thing that we're going to do is that we're going to examine uh, as we go on, and this will be the major focus of ours. The, the first two are going to be a little bit of the introduction today in that review of history and authorship. The next time that we have together will be the examination of Hebrew poetry. And then the following nine times will be a study each, day, each week of a different type of Hebrew uh, poetry or different type of the Psalms. Um, there are, as mentioned, nine different types of Psalms that cover up the 150 uh, Psalms contained within the book. And uh, we will look to uh, these things to kind of help us to understand a little bit more. He writes, uh, the main objective of this study is that you know the history and the background of this Old Testament book, that you appreciate the distinctive style of Hebrew poetry, and that you recognize the differences between the nine different types of psalms. Hopefully, because of this increased understanding, we will be able to draw a greater and more meaningful insight from this beautiful and inspiring book. Let's start by simply looking, as we look at the, the reviewing of history and of the authorship, let's start by simply looking at the, the title, the name, Psalms. Now, I mentioned we're not, I don't know of anybody in here who is proficient in Hebrew language, but we're going to learn one word at least in the Hebrew language, and that is tehillim. That is the word for, the Hebrew word for praises. Now, the Greek translation is psalmoi or psalmai, uh, depending on which way that it's written or which way that it's spoken of. Um, now, our word for that is psalm. Now, this is a transliterated word. Meaning that instead of it being translated into its actual meaning, it is translated as it sounds. A good example of that would be baptizo. Bap baptizo means immersion. But when it is translated, it comes out as baptism. Why? Well, because it's just transliterated uh, more so than translated. And so our word for this song uh, or this book of praises is psalms. Because of uh, the translation from Hebrew to Greek, and then from Greek into English, that's where we get Psalm from Tehillim. So what we're really studying is not necessarily the Psalms. What we are studying is the praises, if you will. Um, we don't often maybe use the word Psalms uh, to refer to anything else maybe but this book. We would use maybe songs or, or songs of praise, this, that, and the other. In fact, we have psalm books uh, that bear that name from time to time. The appeal to the book of Psalms. This is very important here, uh, I think at least. Uh, there are four main things that occur within this appealing nature of the book of Psalms. The first of which is a heightened sense of worship that is presented in many of the Psalms, which satisfies the basic need in all people to seek God. What do I mean by that? I mean that this is used as a way of worship. 
These things are used as ways of worship. In fact, uh, many of our songs in our songbook come directly from psalms written in or collected, compiled within the book of psalms. And so it's used as a way of heightening our worship. You look at the first century church and even before the coming of Christ, when those, uh, even before the canon, the, the collection of the Old Testament books together, which is still to this day seen as the Old Testament, uh, that idea of canon being um, uh, what fits within uh, the, the main focus or what fits within this, this is a book, this is not a book. And that took place even before the coming of Christ. And within that canon, we see the book of Psalms. And so what you would often see in Jesus' day as a way of worship is they would use the book of Psalms as their songbook. They didn't have I don't, uh, songs, sacred songs of the church. You know, they didn't have that. But what they did have was the book of Psalms, the book of songs, the book of, of praises, if you will. And so the first use, if you will, for the appeal for the Psalms is that it is this heightened sense of worship. You'll also notice a great boldness within their prayer. Uh, you know, when we pray, we often pray in very similar ways. I, I even think about it while I'm praying to, to, to try to be more personal, to try not to be repetitive. There are certain things that my mind automatically leans upon in my prayers because I'm, it makes me comfortable. It helps me uh, to feel comfort, not just in a public manner, but also in a private manner. Uh, but when we look at, at prayer in the book of Psalms, you'll notice that all of these Prayers are not necessarily always uplifting. Sometimes they're challenging. We mentioned on Wednesday night uh, in, in passing the uh, book of, of Job and even uh, some of the Psalms of David. They're not always praise God. Sometimes they're, where are you, God? Why did you hand me into the hands of my enemies? Why would you allow for these to, to things to come upon me? It's not necessarily always this praise and adoration, which is what our prayers typically reflect uh, in modern day. But when you look at these psalms, oftentimes they're prayers of, of questioning. Uh, not in a way that is sinful, but in a way that is seeking uh, to, to find answers to solutions or, or to problems. And it's seeking to find answers and solutions to problems that exist within our own minds. And I think a lot of that has to do with the personal relationship or the intimate relationship between the psalmist and, um, and, and our God. I want, you to, I want to ask you something, and I, I genuinely want a show of hands on this one, all right? How many of you have written a song of praise unto the Lord? About what I expected. <laughs> About what I expected. None of us have. And yet what we see from people like David is he wrote 71-ish, give or take, some are debated, 71-ish uh, psalms. Of praise unto God. Now, does that maybe say something about the relationship that David has uh, that is maybe different from ours with, the, with God? With that more personal relationship? We see that reflected in these Psalms. Why? Because there's boldness in them. Because maybe the depth of his relationship with God in a very personal sense is greater than ours. Now, I'm not saying that you're a sinner. They, they were also inspired by God, yes. And that's where we have the collection of them. That's part of the collection, which we'll get to a little bit more when we get towards the authorship side of things. Um, and I'm not saying it's a sin if you don't write a psalm to God. I'm just saying it, it, it maybe shows us a little bit of the dedication that David has. Uh, also, theological certainty. You'll notice that it, it, none of the psalms are used in an apologetic sense. And what I mean by that is uh, the psalms aren't used as a way of trying to convince you of the existence of God. Now, you might make the argument... Uh, of, of psalms like, you know, the, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. But that's not trying to convince you that there is a God. That is giving you a certainty that there is a God. So those who write these psalms are not debating as to the existence of God. They're exalting the name of God in a way that is used to show their certainty within their understanding of God's existence, God's presence, and God's power. And of course, that last thing that is mentioned is probably what we often see the most of is, is the use of psalms, and that is the, the aesthetic beauty or the aesthetic form of the psalms. What immediately comes to my mind is even though this psalm was written 3,000 some odd years ago, we think of Psalm 23 uh, specifically uh, as a very beautiful form of, of poetry, a very beautiful form of exaltation of God. Even if it wasn't written in our language originally, even though it was written 3,000 some odd years ago, 
to a very different culture in a very different world, it still is very poetic and powerful within today's society. Why? Because that's the power of God's Word. That's the power of even this collection of psalms. As Christians, we understand that by faith, these things are so because the psalms are God's work. We, uh, and they're purposefully given unto men and women with these features in mind so that non-believers can find comfort, wisdom, and beauty in this ancient poetry as well. So within this um, focus or within this look into this book, we can see these main appeals of these psalms come in the form of a heightened sense of worship, a boldness within prayer, a sense of theological certainty, as well as the beauty of the, of the, or the aesthetic form of these books. Let's talk a little bit about the authorship. Now, there's different authors, uh, obviously, of, um, of the book of, of Psalms. The main of the, uh, of the writers comes from David. David writing, as I mentioned, 71-ish, 71 confirmed. Uh, many others are debated, if you will, concerning his writings. Uh, ex- um, but uh, as part of that, uh, we see even David's own words concerning his inspiration within his life. In Second Samuel 30, uh, 30 excuse me, 23, in verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was on my tongue. Not just David would mention these things, but even Jesus Himself would confirm the writings uh, of the book of Psalms. He said unto them, in Matthew twenty two forty three. Then how does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, referencing back to the inspiration of even the Psalms uh, that David wrote, or Luke 24 and verse 44. Now he had said unto them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all these things which are written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and notice this, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So David spoke of his own authority uh, and inspiration. Jesus spoke of this inspiration in a confirming sense, as well as Peter confirms these things as well. Acts 1 and verse 16, uh, as we're leading up to uh, that, that powerful sermon in Acts chapter 2, we're given some more information in Acts 1 verse 16 concerning the Psalms. Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning, Ju- concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Referencing back to the psalm uh, in which David is speaking or foretelling of the killing of Jesus. You'll notice even uh, Paul himself, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Something interesting about this verse is we see this all all scripture is inspired uh, by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. At the time of this writing of 2 Timothy, the New Testament canon, as I mentioned, the collection of the books, was not yet finished. How do we know that? Well, because he's still writing. (laughs) But what we do know for a fact is that the Old Testament canon was still the same as it was before Jesus' birth, meaning that when Paul writes that all Scripture is inspired, he includes within that message uh, the things concerning the Old Testament. I want you to notice something about the book of Psalms. No book is quoted more in the New Testament than the book of Psalms. I think there's many reasons to that, which we'll talk about as we go through. But of the 287 quotes that are found within the New Testament concerning the Old Testament, 116 of those come from the book of Psalms. So you can see that the the book of Psalms, although it makes up in, in a large portion, a lot of words, if you will, of the Old Testament, it being the longest book in the Bible, even though it makes up a, a whole lot of words, as far as the uh, percentage-wise, it's, it's not just because there's a lot of words to choose from that the book of Psalms is used so many times or quoted so many times within the New Testament. It's also because of its beauty. Although it is quite a large book, it, uh, it still does not stand up to the extent or the amount that is found uh, throughout the Old Testament. At least percentage-wise, uh, it is uh, seen as quite beautiful enough to be quoted um, in the New Testament quite often, 116 times. Included within that, of course, is the times that Jesus uh, would, would uh, quote the Psalms. There are 150 individual books of Psalms, but there are more than 150 Psalms contained within the uh, Old Testament. Uh, now, uh, 
what I mean by that, and we'll get to it a little bit more in just a second. What I mean by that is that there are more psalms than are uh, included or written in the book of Psalms. Um, and it's part of that. We could notice maybe the Psalm of Moses, you know, this, uh, the Psalm of, of, of Deborah, even, uh, the judge, and uh, I believe it's Judges 5, if you will. And we notice that maybe the beauty within those writings that are not included in the book of Psalms. Uh, why is that? Well, because there's a certain set of Psalms that are compiled that we have today. Uh, now, there's, there's some, un, uh, some interesting things here. Um, uh, these 150 books weren't always compiled in the same way that we have them. And that makes things a little bit confusing at times. It might even bring up some questions concerning these psalms. In fact, these psalms of praises were gathered more so into small collections. And they were arranged by similarity of message or of themes, of catchphrases or of types and forms rather than in the 150 that we have today that were broken up into smaller groups. And then as part of the canon, we see this collection into what we have as the 150 books assembled. That is why when you get to places like Psalm 72 and verse 20, you see that David says that these, or that we see that this is the end of David's Psalms. Yet if you keep reading, just 14 chapters later, you end up in, chap in Psalms 86, which is what? A Psalm of David. You keep going into Psalm 101, 103, and 108, all of which are Psalms of David. So why is it that we see in Psalm 72 and verse 20 that these are the ending of the Psalms of David, and yet we continue to see Psalms of David in Psalm 86, Psalm 101, 103, and 108? Well, that's because of the way that they were compiled. Two smaller, uh, multiple smaller collections ultimately divided into two bigger collections, ultimately all together in what we have is 150 books. That's why you can get to Psalm 7220 and see these are all of them, but then you keep reading and you see actually it's not all the Psalms uh, that David wrote. A few other things to mention. There are duplicate Psalms that also pertains a lot towards that uh, issue of the compiling of multiple collections. Um, you will see uh, within this compilation of these multiple collections, identical psalms. Things that are mentioned once that are mentioned identically somewhere else. For instance, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. You can even notice that these duplicate psalms do not only appear uh, within the book itself. Uh, for instance, Psalm 105, 1 through 15 is also found in, second, in uh, First Chronicles, not Second. Chapter 16, verses 8 through 22. Why is that? Well, once again, because of the compilation, because of the, co the, of the collection. Uh, they did not remove psalms. They simply uh, combined their collections together. Um, the best way that I would know how to describe this is, um, do we have any coin collectors in here? Anybody collect coins? Uh, anybody collect anything fun, you know, something? Somebody tell me one collection. Mr. Johnny, you got a collection of something? Butter bowls. Would not have guessed that one, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you, you, it, one that always comes to my mind too as well is, that, you know those little tiny spoons? You know, the, the ones that you get when you travel, stuff like that? Or uh, what is it, the th it, thimble, right? Isn't that what that's called? The thing on the, yeah, thimbles. You get them you, when you go places. Well, have you ever, as a collector maybe of something, have you ever acquired somebody else's collection that has a duplicate? Maybe a similarity? That happens often within coin collections because they're, they're so similar in a lot of different ways. There's not a lot of variations depending on uh, things. So you might have 100 of your own coins, and you get 50 other coins, and included within that are two or three duplicates. Well, do you throw those away? Well, not typically. They're just part of the collection. You have duplicates. Very similar nature to what we see in the Psalms. The combining of two books, even though they're duplicates, they remain. Uh, not removing those from the collection, but they continue to keep them all together. Uh, also, um, there are uh, short sets of psalms used for uh, various occasions. What do I mean by that? Well, this use of the word hallel, which is, um, uh, well, actually, let me take a step back here. Psalm 113 through 118 is called the hallel, which is the Hebrew word for uh, praise. That going back to what we had uh, talked about uh, men, uh, earlier, mentioning that tehillim, this hallel, is it's it, it being used 
for praise. So this Hallel being used for praise, um, Psalms, uh, they use these, they begin and end with a, a psalm that in, it uses the phrase, praise the Lord. Now, why is that important? Well, when you look at the Hallel, especially within its use, uh, even, even today in the Jewish belief system, this, this Hallel is used in a very repetitious way as part of the Passover feast and as part of festivals. Uh, this is used uh, at, at three main things. The festivals or the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of the New Moon, and the Feast of Passover. And this Hallel, these, uh, this collection from Psalm 113 to 118 is used as a guide for offering up praise. And so um, you see these used in a broad sense in that they are used as a psalm book at times. But you also see them used in a specific sense as where they will use uh, smaller uh, sections as a way of remembering things. Uh, and in fact, the Hallel Psalms are what Jesus sang with the apostles at the Last Supper. Matthew 26 and verse 20 um, shows us that uh, this continuation or this keeping of the Passover. Well, Jesus had not yet died, obviously. So Jesus would have been partaking of the Passover feast in the truest sense, which would have included the singing or the reciting of Psalm 113 through 118. Um, now, there's a, um, uh, this specifically makes up, uh, this Hallel specifically makes up one of the smaller sections, if you will, that help to make up the larger of the uh, collection uh, that once they were combined. I mentioned that some of the Psalms are not included within the book of Psalms. Uh, we can look at Moses' song, as I mentioned, the song of deliverance um, in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 18. Deborah's song of praise in Judges chapter 5. David's lament over Saul, which is uh, interesting considering that David uh, wrote so many psalms included within those moments of lamentation or of sorrow that are included within the book of Psalms. But this one is not. This lamenting over Saul and Jonathan, we see it in 2 Samuel 1. Verses 19 through 27, or even Hezekiah's praise for deliverance in Isaiah 38, verses 9 through 20. Some that we also might could mention uh, would maybe be the, uh, the Psalm of, of Mary. Uh, of course, it would not be mentioned within the, um, within the Psalms because she wasn't around for quite some time afterwards. Uh, but it, it does not have to, uh, in the sense that uh, the way I look at the Psalms is every Psalm does not have to be in the book of Psalms. But everything in the book of Psalms is a song. In the same sense that uh, everybody who lives in Pulaski is a citizen of Giles County, but not everybody who lives in Giles County is a citizen of Pulaski. Uh, the same goes for the Psalms here as well. Just because there's a Psalm does not mean that it has to be included within the Psalms. So you can be reading elsewhere in Scripture, and you can find oftentimes it will say a Psalm of, uh, or a song of praise of, uh, it's, it might not be included in the book of Psalms, but that does not make it any less valid of a psalm within itself. Let's notice a few things concerning the division points of the book of Psalms. I know this is a lot of information, uh, and I know even if you were writing, you couldn't write it all down. I promise you that, because I've tried uh, at the same pace. Uh, but uh, something that's important for us to understand is we need to grasp some of these concepts. Because once we get into the types of psalms... Without us understanding, uh, or once you even dive into your own personal study in depth into the book of Psalms, without some of these things as understanding, you will miss the main message or the main purpose of that book and, or of that specific psalm. And the result of which is that you could maybe misuse or mistreat the Word of God, which we don't want to do. So this is helpful information. I know it's a lot of information, but it's helpful information for us to gain an understanding of a book that although we find it beautiful and maybe even read often, we really don't know a lot about until we begin to grasp a lot more of why and how it was written. Uh, in the same sense that I would say that it is important for you to understand the writers of the gospel accounts, the reasoning behind the gospel accounts, and a lot of that has to do with the audience of the gospel accounts. They focus on different things for different reasons because their audiences are different. And if we don't gain that understanding of a lot of the books, we might can misunderstand or misread 
And included within that, is, uh, or no stranger to that, is the book of Psalms itself. So let's look at some of these division points, if you will. I mentioned that these collections were added up together. They were divided into five major groups, if you will, that eventually became this, this one book that we possess. Now, the, the books, although they're divided into five sections, um, this was more than likely done as a way of, of, of aiding and studying or as well of, of to correspond the five books of the law. Before the end of each section that is mentioned here above, there was a doxology uh, or an oral expression of, of uh, praise. So at the end of each of these sections you will see a, a, a psalm specifically devoted to praise. Now, that does not mean that when you get to Psalm, uh, 42 through, excuse me, uh, psalm 73 through 89, which we talked a little bit about that because of what we studied in uh, Psalm 77 on Wednesday night, you'll notice that that does not mean that every psalm is necessarily going to bring a peaceful, happy-go-lucky message that is all about praise and adoration. Sometimes those psalms are going to include things like heartache and hardship. Sometimes those psalms are going to include things that make mention of maybe a lack of trust or a lack of, of focusing upon, uh, upon God. So just because each section ends with a doxology, an oral expression of praise, does not mean that all those sections are going to be fully dedicated as a way of praise. Now each of these books can be used as a way of praise because as, as we go through and maybe read those moments where David is feeling weak, empty, pointless, vain, feels as if God is far away, following soon after, maybe even in the same psalm, but at least following soon after in other psalms, comes a psalm of praise, a psalm of adoration of God. So even when you feel as if it goes low for quite some time and feels down and feels separate from God or feels empty, just remember that at the end of these, each, uh, at the end of these major divisions, each one contains an oral expression of praise which we call a doxology. Um, we sing a doxology as well. In fact, we have a song called Doxology. Um, and I, I should have thought to tell Bryce to sing it today. But uh, we'll have to sing it some other time. Uh, it, it, I don't know. He could have used it. Uh, something about Bryce and I, we, we, we don't often talk about what I'm preaching, but somehow he always sings songs that has to do with my sermons. I think he just pays attention more than I do uh, to, to what we have conversations about. And maybe I just give it away. But uh, he, he normally does a pretty good job of lining those up. Um, the, uh, the book of Psalms itself is, is, is quite interesting and even quite miraculous within its own collection. Um, anybody know the period, which we t I think we talked about it uh, in the radio program a few weeks back. Anybody know the, the period that is covered, um, excuse me, not the period that is covered, the time that it took to write the entirety of the Bible? How many years it took from the beginning of the end of the writing uh, to, to actually collect what we have as the Bible. Anybody know? Fifteen to 1,600 years. You know how long it took just to write the book of Psalms? 1,200 of those. <laughs> Not in, in the sense that it took, they spent 1,200 years just on this book and only had 300 left over for the others, three to 400 left over. But that shows you the vastness of the collection of the book of Psalms. Uh, that over this large course of time or over this long period of time, um, we, we see quite a, a gap, if you will. Now, um, you'll notice something. A lot of that has to do uh, with people like Moses. <laughs> Moses kind of helps the curve a little bit, if you will. Uh, Moses writes what we know as the earliest psalm, some 1,200 years before the coming of Christ. Um, and that is seen in Psalm 90. And then we get David, uh, which is um, not necessarily the earliest, but is seen as the greatest because of his vast amount of writings in the book of Psalms. He wrote around 1050 B.C. is where the majority of his were collected, at least. And uh, most of those, I mentioned it, you got those multiple collections, you get to 72, and, uh, and it tells you he's done, and then there's still more. Most of his psalms are collected in one, uh, one single location, and that is Psalm 1. Through 41. Uh, but there's 30 other ones that are kind of spread out. But Psalm 1 through 41, that's David. That's, that's his writings. Um, and I say most, but, but barely most, only by 10. Uh, just barely over that line, if you will, are collected there. But if you look at Psalm 1 through 41, hey, that's, that's David. That's his writings. Uh, 
And that occurred around that year 1050 uh, B.C. Uh, Solomon, around 950 B.C., he wrote a few psalms. Uh, Asaph, uh, or the, as well as the sons of Korah, Ethan, uh, Heman, and the unknown authors, all wrote within that 900 to 400 B.C. time. So from uh, 1,400 years before the coming of Christ up until about 400 years before the coming of Christ, uh, we see these collection of psalms mostly being written. So even that 1,200 is a, a wiggly number, if you will, not quite for certain, uh, but we're doing the best that we can with the knowledge that we have about the time of writing. Uh, and you think uh, just within the past 1,200 years, Maybe how much things have changed within our world, um, even within the past 100 years, 200, 300, this, that, and the other. And so you think over the course of 1,200 years, there's a lot of up and downs. There's a lot of moments of, of moving around and things changing and people seeing things differently. And yet this 1,200 years to collect these psalms or to have all of them written, some 3,000, 2,000-ish uh, years later, if you will, these psalms are still applicable. Uh, and even looking to uh, Moses' earliest psalms, you know, uh, roughly uh, 34 and a half, or 34 and 24 years uh, later, uh, Psalm 90 still carries some power within it. So you see, it's powerful. And that's part of it being part of the, um, the um, canon, or part of, uh, part of it being part of the Word of God. A few things... Um, for us to, uh, to note um, concerning the use of the Psalms. Uh, I find this very interesting. The Psalms were considered at one point, as we mentioned, as the Jewish psalm book in the Old Testament times. It was used both in temple worship as well as in synagogue prayer and praise. And at home as a hymnal or a guide for devotional purposes. And so we maybe go back in our minds to some of those appealing natures uh, or the appealing parts of Psalms, that heightened sense of worship, that boldness in prayer, the theological uh, certainty as well as the aesthetic form. It, it helps to, to be a guide uh, in, in our worship. Included within that was the worship in the Jewish temples, uh, synagogue, prayers and, uh, synagogue and prayers as well as in praise. And what I find absolutely beautiful as well is at home as a hymnal or a guide for devotional purposes. You look over that 1,200-year uh, span, if you will. In that 1,200 years, a lot happened, uh, especially to the people of Israel. You'll note with Moses, you know, just think about in the time from Moses unto David, <laughs> quite a lot took place. Uh, quite a large portion even of the Old Testament took place within that time period. Even continuing with that into the years of Solomon, of course, up until that intertestament period, that 400 some odd years before Jesus came to this earth. That's the history of the Jewish people. And you see it within the book of Psalms. Uh, we mentioned even on um, Wednesday night in Psalm 77, the recording or the song of the chief musician Asaph. Um, and included within that was a telling of God's deliverance of the people of Moses. And so it's no wonder that in the temple... And even in uh, the synagogues, as well as in one's own home, these are used as a way of telling God's power within uh, within the home. I've only got a few more minutes, so I got to I got to speed through this last little section. Um, some of the uses for the Book of Psalms uh, it is very powerful, and then it provides a sense of apologetics. If you remember, I mentioned uh, that this that the Psalms are not necessarily intended. To be apologetic in nature, although they can be used in an apolog uh, in, uh, apologetic sense. Um, uh, not in the sense that they're used as an apology, but it, it's used as a way of confirming uh, maybe that Jesus is of, uh, the Son of God even, or that uh, David is inspired, or that Solomon was inspired, or that God uh, and his entire word is inspired. We notice in Luke 24 and verse 44, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you, well, I was still with you that all things which were written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Going back to that mentioning of Jesus' words there. Uh, it also is used as a way of devotion or as a way of expanding our relationship with God. It enhances our prayer and devotion experience and that the Psalms help us to develop a pious vocabulary 
uh, and, and spirit as, a, as we seek to offer acceptable worship to God. It helps us to gain a further understanding of God and to describe the wondrous praise of God's power, glory, and wisdom. As part of that gaining understanding, I think that that's the next one, but as part of that gaining understanding, I think that that very deeply com, uh, complements that devotion. As I gain further understanding, I have a, a reason to devote myself more into God. In the same sense that when you study the Word of God and you dive deep more and more into it, the deeper that you dive, the further you will gain uh, knowledge or the more knowledge that you will gain. And as part of that, the deeper your relationship with God will be and the deeper uh, that, that sincerity will be. Uh, they deepen our knowledge of and a relationship with Him and help us to understand the link between thanksgiving as well as contentment. Focusing on what we do not have leads to dissatisfaction. However, Recognizing and giving thanks for what we do have creates and nourishes a sense of contentment and well-being within our souls. The Psalms serve us in this process by providing the language and understanding that we need to effectively give thanks. You say, I don't really know how to pray that well. I don't feel as if I'm doing it right. Maybe I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to express thanksgiving you got a whole book of them. <laughs> you got 150 options. And if you spend time in Psalm 119, you got quite a lot that you can gain from, from that. Going all the way through each of the Hebrew uh, letters of the alphabet help to divide that into smaller sections as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But you don't know what to do. Okay, open to the book of Psalms. You've got a guide. You've got a, a path that you can follow. You can maybe see some of the praises and adoration that are used by people like David, Solomon, and Asaph. And the last thing that the, use, uh, that the Psalms is used for is for our own personal development. And that goes along uh, kind of in a sense that, that apologetics helps us to see the power of God, the presence of God, and the effectiveness and the truthfulness of His Word. Included within that should be a further devotion within our own lives. And, and that leads to a better understanding, which of course develops us into better more perfect uh, servants of His. The Psalms also teach us the, uh, the godly response to sorrow, fear, discouragement, anger, even things like disbelief, but reminds us in moments of victory to have joy. They explore and explain uh, the believer's feelings as they relate to God and to the world that is around him. So as you work your way through this book, our hope or the goal of this is to learn and understand the use of of language of prayer and praise that is given unto us by God in order to equip every saint for the purpose of acceptable and edifying, or uh, yeah, acceptable and edifying worship. What do I mean by that? Or what does Mike mean by that? The focus of this is for us to turn to the God that God gave us to worship Him as a way of using it to worship Him. You need to worship more, you need to focus more, you need to meditate more, you need to praise more. Here is your path. Here's your way. In the same way that God has given us a path or a plan for salvation, He gives us the book of Psalms as a way of using or as a thing to use in order to worship Him better or to more accurately or more honestly worship Him. All right. I mentioned Brother Irby will be here next week, uh, but the week after we will talk a little bit about Hebrew poetry, and that's where we get into the Psalms. Then we're going to spend nine weeks looking at the different types of Psalms. And we'll do some deep dives, at least into one psalm each week. And I know it went over my time, but I appreciate you letting me, uh, letting me have your attention this morning.